Doodle Bud here. Today we're doing something a little different. We're doing a video that's a kind of made by you guys. So I threw up a post the other day asking what are your questions? I want to do a video that's based on those. So I'm going to come up with some answers, go through the questions. We'll chat about pens, all sorts of different topics. Let's have some funs and talk pens. So question number one comes from Yash Kapadia asking how I got into fountain pens and how I decide to start collecting and then reviewing pens. Well, reviewing and collecting wasn't my initial thing, but I do a lot of writing. I meet people all day long, and these were sort of my usual pens. You know, you just get a gel pen, or you spend a couple bucks more and get something with fancy stripes that all kind of chip off. Anyways, but they're kind of boring, and I realized, you know, fountain pens are kind of cool, and even something like this $3 uh, zebra pen that you can pick up writes better than your regular ballpoint or even some of your gel pens. So that's how I got into fountain pens. And then just as you all are aware, it just steers vastly out of control. But honestly, would you rather write with one of those or this beautiful puppy every single day? So that's how I got into fountain pens and the thing grew from there. The review part was never planned. It sort of had to do with uh, the whole COVID lockdown situation. Our Vancouver Pen Club meetings got uh, shut down in person and got turned into uh, online Zoom meetings. And it was great. Uh, thank you so much to Maya for keeping us connected during that time. Um, but they were nowhere near as good as in-person meetings when, you know, if you want to drop coin on an expensive pen, you want to look at it and really see what it's all about. And so one night, just kind of bummed about not being able to hold pens in my hands, I thought, let me at least do uh, a video. I'll just do a video, just random idea. And uh, so that's what I did, and it came from there. But it was interesting because we had our first in-person meeting last week, which was fantastic, and pens get passed around. We chat, and when I get a pen and look at it, I think I was probably the only one doing this. The first thing I do, I mean, I'm looking at all the little bits of construction, build quality, tolerances, how things work, how they machined it, all those little things. I'm trying to put the pen together. We'll take it apart and put it back together and make it in my mind to see what they did and what they did right, what they did wrong. So that's the first thing I do when I do pens. So I thought, let me make my channel sort of steer towards there. And that's how I got started with the whole YouTube gig. Next question comes from Donnie Pierce asking, have I found the perfect pen or am I still on the hunt? Well, I'm always, I'm always looking. So I guess I'm still always on the hunt. There are pens that are on my mind. There's another question coming up about Grail pens. I'll chat about that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if there's ever going to be a perfect pen because there's so many different materials, capping mechanisms, shapes and styles and nibs. So I, I sort of take the buffet approach and I want to try them all. Will there be a perfect pen one day? One pen I must have no matter what, if I had to start over, I, I, there are a few pens like that I currently have. What is the perfect pen? It's probably a rhetorical question. The next question comes from Archivist 17 asking a little bit about my engineering background. To do that, I brought in a prop. My favorite book called Building Scientific Apparatus. This name right here is very big time in the engineering world. I'll try to keep it brief, but uh, I studied computer hardware engineering at the University of Victoria and then worked in a bunch of different fields, mostly not computer hardware design. So um, I did a little bit of that. I do a little electrical work, but most of my work was to deal with uh, kind of this topic, designing and assembling, you know, quality control, support of precision laser measurement equipment uh, or some other equipment uh, sort of before that in the pre-press printing industry. And you have to just know lots of different stuff <laughs> from different disciplines, whether it's optics, uh, going into the machine shop, making parts, uh, assembling things. So you're going to have to know about materials and types of joints, machining practices, just all this type of stuff. So I wore a lot of different hats. Uh, I would machine parts. I would be inspection in QC. I would be in the electrical department assembling, you know, sometimes boards and cables and all that stuff as well. Uh, dealing with R&D, putting together new systems and optics, having to make cool custom things. I've worked in chemistry labs, even with scanning electron microscopes. Um, just all sorts of stuff in the office, in the field, in the shop, doing installs where people literally have a stopwatch and they have 20 minutes tick and it's go time. You have 20 minutes to get this thing going. So it came in handy being multidisciplined because I remember one time during an install, uh, the people who installed the gear messed it up, screwed it up. The parts were broken. I had to make new brackets. There was a machine shop. Luckily, I, you know, know what I'm doing so I can make the parts of my assistant that day to help me install some very technical precision laser measurement equipment. His name was Cletus and he wore coveralls with no shirt. 
but it was all good. He was there. He helped me out. <laughs> we got through it together. But luckily, I knew my stuff. I was able to explain things to him, and uh, we got that gear up and running. So, but yeah, I've spent so much time in uh, in different fields, which I'm very, very fortunate for. I wasn't sort of pigeonholed just in knowing you know, circuit design or just how to, you know, design parts or just fastener. It was just the, the whole breadth and depth of everything included, which was really, really neat. And so I have, a, you know, a bit of a broad knowledge. I wouldn't say I'm a master in any area, but one thing when you make stuff, when you're trying to do precision instrumentation or precision measurements, uh, I guess maybe that's why I have a bit of a keen eye. So when I review pens, uh, I review them as if I'm looking at tiny little optical instruments that we had to do you know mounts for cameras or lasers or just how everything goes together and you, your brain starts thinking about all the things that can happen um that's how i look at pretty much everything and so i sort of bring that a tamed down version of that into the fountain pen world so thanks for the question hope you enjoy the answer next question has to do with inks it's sort of gonna be a, a twofer as i talked about before a two in one question so first part was palesh uh pearson asking about um ink reviews from an engineering perspective i'll tackle that and the next one came from wendy holiday just talking about sort of ph on inks so i i have some stuff going on about that so i'll kind of combine the answers together so i did do a bit of an engineering type ink review had to do with sheening inks i busted out the microscope that was kind of the main reason i got this just to really understand how the sheen works on those inks and and how those properties happen so that was kind of fun for me the next one i'm working on does involve uh, measuring pH a little bit, but there's this whole sort of concept that everything has to be pH neutral. And well, water, distilled water when you make it is pH neutral, but instantly it reacts with the carbon dioxide in the air and creates carbonic acid. So it's going to be acidic right out of the gate. So I have sort of a, a comment on that perspective. Let, let's say you have a pen. Let's let's especially a vintage pen. All right. So let's say you find this pen in a drawer and it's inked. Would you rather have it filled up with an ink that has a pH of seven? All right. But it's ink and it's been there for 30 years. Or would you rather find the pen and it was filled with water and it's been there for 30 years? So depending on the water, you could have some pretty nasty water, but I would take my chances with the water over ink and especially there's other properties too like if it's a sheening ink man that stuff can clog up uh feeds and and really eat parts as well so um yeah as far as the ph that is one parameter and you do got to be careful with some especially long term but it's not the only one the other thing i'm doing right now and the reason i don't have this done is when we talk about inks there's one parameter we want to talk about which is uh the wetness and so the standard wetness test let me get a piece of paper i'll show you so the standard wetness test is you do this with a pen and go smear and then we're determining what the wetness of the ink is off of this well you got different nibs you got different feeds you got different point sizes uh, you could color a little bit you could color a lot light pressure firm pressure there's so many variables and we don't really have any uh, measurable any parameters for wetness other than high or low or flow high or low uh, and sort of in between and so there's no kind of standards on that so coming from the engineering background the scientific background i'm playing around with these guys here so these are capillary tubes and so i was running into some issues but i think i found the problem the challenge with doing a test like this i got to sample a bunch of inks which is no problem i have some but uh, you can't just do one measurement per ink. You really have to do like 10 and there's a lot of inks and you have to do the measurements. You got to plot your results, your standard deviations, all this sort of stuff and do like a statistical analysis on it, which I'm kind of dreading, but I have done some initial tests, something simple everyone can do. You can put it in the ink and all of a sudden you can compare wetness. You could quantify it. And also I was playing around with it. Um, you know, these will also do surface tension. So like surface tension and wetness i'm playing around with that a little bit so we can have a standardized all-in-one ink test uh, fingers crossed i can get around to it but that's uh, sort of my thoughts on the ink ph yeah that's important but not the only parameter there's so many other things we got to think about when it comes to inks and so i'll see what i can get as far as progress on our answering that and having a standardized test the next question has to do about titanium and that's why these pens are out it comes from paul McHugh saying that he he's enjoyed my presentation on how to mess around with titanium and anodize it in different ways. Can you undo it? And the answer is yes. So here is a part that looked sort of like this, 
and now it looks back to regular titanium. I'm going to be doing some more uh, coatings and stuff like that, playing it around. So how do you get it off? You could just sand it and stuff like that, or we got to get a little bit nasty with some chemicals. This is an easy to find one. It's called Wink Rust Stain Remover. You have to get the made in the USA version, even in Canada if it says made in USA. Won't be the same because there is a certain ingredient in here where the skull and crossbones are, which is hydrofluoric acid. This stuff is nasty. This is only a one to two and a half percent solution, but hydrofluoric acid is seriously bad stuff. It will remove the titanium uh, oxide layer that's on here quite effectively as well. There's some other stuff called multi-etch, which is a lot safer, but it's a lot more expensive. You have to buy it in large quantities. So uh, I use this stuff instead. And here's actually a quick little video. I was chatting with Ben Walsh from Gravitas Pens because we're chatting a little bit about titanium and coatings and ideas. And we're actually uh, experimenting back and forth, showing each other the results. And uh, he's getting some serious hydrofluoric acid and had some questions about safety. So I'm no safety expert, but I showed him a quick setup, a little video of what I'm doing when I'm doing it outside. So I'll I'll show that real quick as well. The next several questions are going to revolve around nibs. The first one is coming from Phil and McCracken, who asked, what's your favorite nib size, style, and why? So that's a bit of a tricky one, but I guess I do have a tendency towards fine nibs, like say on this nice little uh, Pilot Elite. I love the fine nib on this vintage one. This has an extra fine. This is sort of a fine. This is a fine cursive italic. I got this ground down to a fine. This has a fine, so you can sort of see the trend. I don't mind larger size nibs, but I usually like a fine somewhere around there um, just for the style of writing and printing I do. But if I could pick sort of one grind, I do like obliques. So this Mont Blanc 24, this has a stock if we can focus oblique broad nib. I don't mind a broader nib if there's a grind on it, like say a cursive italic or an oblique because you can get some variation, you can get those thick lines going up and thicker lines kind of with the different writing styles. And also too, you can you can rotate it and have it sort of like a, a architect nib so you can do cool things like that. But I probably my favorite, and happens to be on this pen right now, is a fine cursive italic. And that's what I have on this Mont Blanc 149. I did this one myself. This was only actually the second pen I ever ground. <laughs> um, but it works exceptionally well. I, I love, a fine nib, but I want a little something more to it. So it does get ground a little, a little wider than a fine, just as you're adjusting the the nib, uh, the tipping shape and size. So maybe it's a little more medium-ish, but it's got a nice little line variation. It's nothing over the top. Something I can still use for everyday writing. Even this Visconti Homo Sapien that I got, um, it's got some nice flex and bounce to it. I was playing around with it. You saw it on the uh, little flex off that I did the other day. Regular light pressure. It's nice and fine, but has a little bounce. And even my Pelican. 140, I don't know where it is, somewhere. Um, regular writing style with very little pressure. It's like a fine, but it's got a little bounce. So a fine nib, and if it has a cursive italic grind, muy bueno. The next question comes from Lawrence Willis asking me about feud nibs. I tried one in the past that wasn't for me. Have I tried any others from other manufacturers? And the answer is no. Um, I'm sure they're probably fine, but just the, the whole thing with the bent nib and how it writes, it just really wasn't for me. So that's that's a quick one to that one. Next one comes from a Jiro Fika name asking me about ultra extra fines and needle points. I don't have any of those, but if I want to do some fine writing, these are a couple pens I'll go for. So this is the Visconti Homo Sapien that was ground down. Uh, nice little fine, extra fine line. If you do it reverse, it's pretty good. I, let me zoom in here. It's, it's, it's pretty small. So that gives you an idea. He was asking that, especially about downstrokes. Next one is this Pilot Elite. Lovely little pen and reverse writing. I get a little shaky with the Homo sapien. You can see those straight lines weren't very good, but with the Pilot Elite, they're pretty darn good, fairly straight going down. So those would be the ones I would pick, but uh, I know how he uses his pens a bit. It's a lot of drawing and sketching and lots of lines. You want a super fine line for that. I don't have any pens like that. The finest line I would have would be on a calligraphy nib. And those are untipped. You wouldn't want to do that, and especially downstrokes. Well, that's where those things flare the most. So those are sort of out of the question for his usage. But that's the only input I can give you on that one. Sorry, buddy. The next question comes from Lynn Nguyen asking, is there an alternative to the Pilot 50 nib from a writing experience? He tried out a pen that has one, and he was willing to sell his whole collection for it. So what it really sounds like is he found his dream pen and nib 
uh, combination. I have not tried a Pilot 50, so I can't really speak on the matter other than there are lots of great nibs out there, but maybe he has tried everything and that was a clear standout. Like for example, this little Parker Dual Fold, this vintage one from the 30s, this nib is such a pleasure to write with. I absolutely love it. It is perfectly wet and smooth. Same goes for this old uh, Schaefer PFM version 5. Beautiful looking nib and writes wonderfully. And lots of other pens I have, you know, and I can tune them and adjust them and stuff as well. But uh, as far as what's better than that nib, if you think that's the best nib on the planet and that you got to have one, well, now <laughs> you're kind of screwed because the price is expensive, but you really, really want one. Uh, conversely, I'll, I found, I sent him back. Well, you might have to sell your house if you want to buy this one. I found a listing on eBay. It was like $160,000 for one of these pens. Absolutely nuts. So sky's the limit when uh, you're talking pens sometimes. Actually, something I forgot to mention on one of the previous questions about the engineering and ink. What are some things I'm interested in? Actually, this is it right here. Bernanke Blue from Noodlers. And also, I don't have it yet. I want to get a sample. Next time I order a pen from the U.S., I get me a little sample of the X Feather. Completely opposite properties when it comes to ink. One dries instantly, the other one takes forever. And that's going to pair nicely with that little measurement test I have and things I want to do. So, uh, yeah, Bernanke Blue, I have some. I need to get some X Feather. That's going to go well with some testing. The next question comes from Stefan Wood. It's quite a long one, but just the overall theme of it is asking Am I seeing an improvement? in the overall quality of pens coming from companies, say like Jin Hao or Wing Sung. Um, and overall, I would say, yes, I, I, I found that there are some improvements. So like, say for example, this Moon Man, I only keep it because it's so terrible. I was blown away for the, and they actually, this wasn't like a $5 pen. This was much more, maybe 30 bucks or 35. And I was blown away how terrible it was. You can, you can see it's delaminating. The threads ripped off like crazy. The cap is crooked. It didn't write very well. Everything's just rattling. Like, I was just blown away how terrible this is. And burrs, just everything. There was, like, no redeeming qualities about this pen whatsoever. But as time has gone on, um, other pens are out there. And I've received them. Some of them have been around for a while. But, like, say, this Wingsung 699. Yes, it's a knockoff of another pen. But the build quality is pretty damn good. Especially for the price. Very impressed with this Mahjong A1. Uh, like a few little things, there's going to be variations in batch qualities and stuff too. Um, but overall, very pleased with this pen. Even this Asfine, I was very pleased with it, but also a little disappointed because there's a few little things that they paid closer attention to. It would just kind of next level the pens. And it's kind of like just right in the initial design if they tweaked it a little bit. So, but overall, I found the build quality does seem to be getting better. Some of the design things that drive me bonkers are getting improved. Um, I, I can't give really any details, but there was someone from one company that reached out to me and chatted about some pens and one they were having come out. And I gave some thoughts. We back and forth a little bit. Now the pen is out and it's working quite well but that's all i want to say about that but anyways i do find the overall quality s seems to be coming in at a higher level now there's still those like two three dollar pens i'm not in it to find out how good of a pen i can get for four bucks some of them are good but there's a bunch that are trash um but if you're willing to spend you know 20 30 40 somewhere in that range you're actually getting some decent pens so uh yeah i find the quality has gone up a bit next question forgive me if i don't say this right comes from Drew singh asking which is my most expensive pen and how much my collection is worth i don't know how much my collection is worth really i, I haven't kept track i i, I just don't kind of uh, approach it that way but the most i paid for a pen would be for this omas 556f this vintage one lovely flex nib I think it was maybe, was it 330 or 350 euros, something in that range. Um, so that worked out to approximately 500 smackers Canadian. So that was a big spend for me. That's the most I spent on any pen. I do have other pens here that are worth more. Uh, this one I got a sweet deal. It's worth a lot more than I paid for it now, but especially these ones here. Um, but I got deals on them. So this one I got for just over 300 bucks. So that's a pretty sweet deal, the Mont Blanc 149, my Visconti Homo Sapien. 
uh, with the exchange and all that, three fifty maybe with shipping. It was four somewhere in that range. I had to spend an extra fifty bucks to get the nib done, but that was a sweet deal. Uh, this guy here too, I bought it overseas, had a coupon code, and there was a sale. Um, so yeah, as far as my most expensive pen, this is the most I've paid. But I I have ones that are worth more, but I didn't pay that price, and I have no idea what my collection is worth. This question comes from Stefan or Steven. I never know which way to say it, but um, he was asking, what's the most I could ever see myself spending on a pen? There is one he was looking at. It's $2,000. He couldn't imagine spending that. Either could I. And what was maybe my grail pen or multiple ones. So I always look for a deal no matter what. Um, I sort of try to set a price in mind first and then see if there's any way to get a pen for that price is sort of my way to approach things. A pen that's really on my mind, the concept of a grail pen I find is, is uh, you know, the, the purple dragon that you can never catch, right? It's just ever moving target. There's always new stuff you find, but one that is on there has been there from like day one, as soon as I saw it is a Omas 360. To me, that pen is super slick, looks gorgeous. I really want to get my hands on one of those one day. Almost wrapping up the list of questions I got here. Second to last comes from Lone Eagle 270 sort of chatting a little bit about, I guess he's into guitars and a common thing to do is buy a budget guitar and then tweak it to make it an even better guitar. Would you ever do that with a, a pen, take a budget pen and just see how good you can get it? Yeah. I've, I've kind of liked the idea that some people will maybe just love a Lamy Safari or their Lamy All-Star and they'll slap on a gold nib. You can buy the gold nib separate and put a gold nib on there. So I've seen some people do that. They do that with other pens as well. Um, like say there's Noodler's Ahab. I wanted to see just how good I can get this thing writing. It was really bad for skipping and everything else. Here, let me wipe that section off. I can see some ink. I'm going to get it on my fingers. Much better. So I wanted to get this pen writing without skipping and see what I could do for maximum line variation. I have a series of videos on this one. And I can really lay down some serious line variation with this pen now. And uh, yeah, after eventually if you do that, which is crazy, it'll skip. But uh, yeah, you can really max this thing out, get some awesome flex to it. Um, so this is something I've done, I guess, with a, a bud, more of a budget pen and, and tweaked it around with it to see how far I can get it, how far I can take it, how good I can make it. It, uh, it does sort of limit itself with pens a little bit. You can, you know, obviously slap on a gold nib or maybe grind the nib. I've done that with lots of pens. I did that with the Amazon Basics pen. Pretty basic, boring pen, nothing special. So I ground the nib. Now it writes kind of cool. I've done that with other pens as well. So that's one thing you can do. Um, I guess you could, you know, Franken pen some, but there comes a point where depending on the materials and stuff like that, it's, it's still, you know, not a premium pen. How much do you want to sink into that? and uh, versus just getting an already pretty decent premium pen, especially if you find one used or you find a vintage one to restore it. Um, that might economically just make a little more sense because at the end of the day, you could have, you could put a gold nib on this thing and just go crazy. But I would <laughs> probably rather have a different pen than this Noodler's with a gold nib. But yeah, for very little money, you can uh, play around with this pen and tweak it and get it writing quite well as a flex pen. So that is definitely something you can do. So the last question comes from Javi C asking me if I could design a pen, what would it be? The nib size, material, shape, color, all that stuff. And just so happens I got this little pen here from Maya Furlong. She was so kind. Uh, she got this for me because she knows that I love the Omas 360 and it's been on my mind. And this is just like a little cheap version of it. Plastic one. She got it on eBay. I'm going to do a review on this. Haven't even inked it yet, but this sort of has that Omas 360 shape. And I've been wanting to 3D print a pen, sort of based on the Omas 360. And this is great because this will give me some overall dimensions and some ideas when I look at something. And uh, so, yeah, that would be the overall shape probably is take an Omas 360 and look something like that. There'd be a lot of different pens I'd love to design if I had the time, but that would probably be my first one. Materials, that's a tricky question. If you're going to make a few pens or just one, I might either get like a cool... Uh, acrylic or something like that that's easy to do or uh, you know some type of metal and machine it that way if you wanted to go in production you would probably use other materials you're going to be talking injection molding and there's all these other features you can do but just making a small batch of pens that's out of the question so it's a tricky one for me when it comes to materials and colors um, because a lot of it has to do on prices and all those things I, I love titanium 
a titanium pen would be cool, but there's all sorts of other materials I'm really interested in too. I don't know how well those other materials would do as far as people buying it. So is it a pen I'm going to make just for myself or a pen I'm, I want to sell to others? That That's a huge part of the decision-making process when it comes to things you would do. Nib, um, again, there's a price point on there too, but I probably just start off. My next pen I make is going to be like a number six, maybe a number eight nib pen, you know, probably steel. And most likely I'll grind it to a cursive italic, like a fine or medium cursive italic, something like that. But then if I were to design from scratch, there's some really cool materials I would love to play with for a nib that would do things that uh, no other nibs could do. I uh, might even just order some of that material just to play around, see what I can pull off. So it's a tricky question because I have tons of ideas and uh, I like to sort of think outside the box and not do things the way we've always done them. Just sort of open, open it up to new concepts and ideas and materials and methods and all that type of stuff as well. So that is a tricky question, but I, I'm planning at some point to 3D print a pen, and I'll obviously talk about that process and what it looks like, and that will give you maybe some insight on if I could design a pen, what would it be that will probably have a few ideas. But yeah, 360-ish, almost 360 would be the general feel of a pen if I could make one. So many pens, too little time. Thanks for all the questions everyone threw at me and who have been watching and subscribing. I thought this would be a first go. If you'd like me to do this again, let me know in the, in the comments down below. And I'm more than happy to do this. Have some fun here from everybody who's been watching and uh, answer some of the questions you have. So that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching. I'm going to have a special video coming up. I just clicked over the million views. So that was cool. Thanks everybody for doing that. You're all, that's you, right? <laughs> who've been helping me get there. I'm going to do a special giveaway fun video. Details will be coming up, plus lots of other reviews. And that's all I got for now. So thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.